as you saw, this is being recorded. So um, if you would not like your face to be on screen, please go off of video um, and please keep in mind that this will be recorded. Also, please keep in mind that if you are not on mute, we'll be able to hear you throughout the event. So just unmute yourself if you want to be heard and otherwise stay muted. The Just Transition Collective works throughout the unceded territories of the Indigenous peoples of Alaska, as you can see by the many different lands listed in the chat. We're a group of six organizations working for a transition from the extractive and inequitable governance economies and state of being that many of us operate in today toward healthy, regenerative economies for all Alaskans. And we recognize that the intergenerational knowledge of Indigenous peoples forms the basis for this transition and that we can remember forward healthier communities once our meaningful and loving relationships with each other, particularly with Black, Indigenous, and people of color, can create the conditions for radical change. My name is Michaela Stith. I'm a lifelong Alaskan who goes by she, her pronouns, and I am Black and white. I'm actually not in the state right now, unfortunately. I'm calling in from Piscataway lands in Washington, DC, but I'm so excited to be here um, and about today's theme, queer love as resistance as a queer lady myself. So without further ado, even as folks are coming in, I will pass it off to Tara to give us some news and updates about Just Transition in Alaska. Thanks again for coming. Thanks, Michaela. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so cool to see so many new faces and I'm seeing faces of friends that I don't normally work with here and just I'm really, really happy to be here with all of you today. My name's Tara Chrisman. My pronouns are she, her. I'm here living and working on Lower Tanana Diné lands here in so-called Fairbanks, and I'm the communications coordinator for Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition. I also help out on the comms teams for the JTC and for the Alaska Climate Alliance. And the big update that I wanted to share was about the fly-in that we did last week with the Alaska Climate Alliance. Um, so a little bit about the Climate Alliance. It's a statewide organization that's built alignment between environmental groups, frontline communities, and the private sector under Indigenous leadership and under the principles of a just transition. They've been meeting since October of 2020 and um, working to address the climate crisis head on ever since then. So last week, I was so lucky I got to join this group of Alaskans from all over the state to do this big first mobilization of the ACA, and that was this legislative fly into Juneau. We had 14 delegates from nine different communities from all over Alaska, and we started off the trip with a awesome community gathering and potluck hosted by SEAC and Juno 350. Thank you. I got to eat so much yummy food, especially salmon, and I was very happy about that. Um, and then over the next couple of days, we held over 80 meetings with 40 uh, different legislators and we attended committee meetings. And then on our last day there, we held a rally in front of the Capitol. We were there asking for four different policies to be passed. Let me get my notes here. <laughs> I would think I'd memorize them all by now. But the first one was the Alaska Green Bank. We're asking for that to be housed in the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation. We are asking for renewable portfolio standards to set benchmarks for utilities along the rail belt, the extension of the Renewable Energy Grant Fund, and the institution of community solar legislation. The Renewable Energy Grant Fund actually has been introduced already under the House and the Senate, Senate Bill 33 and House Bill 62, if you're into dorking out on bills, um, but we're confident we're gonna see the others introduced soon. So we're asking our community to get involved by pushing our elected leaders to pass these policies and others like them. So you can learn more at akclimatealliance.org slash policies, where we have all four policies lined out and you can also sign petitions for each of them 
But the big thing I want to encourage is that each of you take time to individually reach your representatives, call them, write an email, or you can even call and ask to be scheduled for a phone call or a video chat where you can um, really share your concerns about not only the climate crisis, but anything you have going on in your life that you want to see them help make a difference. Um, so again, if you want to follow those four policies in the Alaska Climate Alliance, the URL is akclimatealliance.org slash policies. And I hope you go check it out and uh, help build some good new stuff with us. Thanks. Well, thank you, uh, Tara, for those updates. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, my name is Adam Ortega. Uh, I'm in Anchorage on Denial of Lands as well. Uh, I'm the Communications Coordinator for Alaska Community Action on Toxics, and I'm going to provide some updates uh, and calls to action, rather, um, for the Just Transition Collective. Uh, the first one, our uh, regeneration zine, is looking for artist submissions by February 14th. Uh, regeneration, again, is a uh, youth-led narrative amplifying uh, the JTC framework through art. Uh, and the theme for the spring is lighting the match. So what gets your blood pumping? Uh, how do you ignite that spark in your community to, uh, to make change? Um, and we'll go ahead and drop the uh, thank you glow for dropping that as well there. Um, and just some things that to keep in mind when you're submitting um, your artist name, pronouns, bio, legal name and mailing address, uh, link or attachment for the submission, of course, uh, the title of your work uh, and what the theme means to you and a description of your work. And there is a few other additional guidelines um, in that uh, URL that uh, Glow just put in the chat. Uh, Tara talked a little bit about uh, uh, the Alaska Climate <clears throat> Alliance policy sign on that we're looking for, uh, trying to make meaningful change in the legislator, uh, legislature this year. Uh, and that first one again was to establish a green bank, but also to put that green bank in a community oriented agency like the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation, uh, enacting a renewable portfolio standard uh, to, um, to guard the rain belt utility customers from volatile, uh, volatile like fuel prices. So Definitely a good one there. And then also just to pass some community solar legislation. You know, we want renewable energy, but we want that in the hands of communities and neighborhoods to uh, be able to make the change themselves. Uh, and then also the, another one was to extend the renewable energy fund. Uh, it's set to expire this year. Um, and so I think it's critical that we uh, need to definitely just expand that uh, to just invest on a scale that uh, supports a just transition. So really some meaningful policies that we are all able to sign on there. Yeah, thank you, Tara, for that. Uh, so shout out to Alaska uh, Climate Alliance there for doing that. Um, and then another one here, another call to action is on the 28th, this deadline to uh, make a comment on old uh, growth logging in the Southeast. Uh, so the DNR and the Division of Forestry released their five-year plan, which uh, includes like old growth logging, which would be super destructive and really against uh, the JTC. So the public has until the 28th. And uh, also with um, that URL, there's also some comments in there uh, to get make your language a little bit stronger. So and then the last one here uh, is from the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition uh, with their Keep It In The Ground uh, working group petitioners calling for oil and gas tax code sign-ons. Uh, calling on legislator, legislators to reform Alaska oil and gas tax codes. Uh, the JTC, you know, we're trying to move away from the extractive industry, trying to uh, move toward a more regenerative, regenerative industry uh, by doing uh, the following things, um, like decreasing the sliding scale for per barrel tax to five from $8, uh, uh, as recommended by the Department of Revenue, which would generate between 165 million and $330 million annually. And also to just put a 25% windmill tax on uh, profit fossil fuel companies. Um, they are making a boatload of money right now. So we believe that 25% is, is good you know, for that. Um, and also to include corporate income tax on, oil, uh, on all oil and gas business entities in Alaska. Um, and we ask that these revenues revenues be used to reinvigorate our education system, support houseless, uh, unho unhoused people, 
and uh, kind of just for a transition, our labor for environmental justice causes as well. Um, all really good things there for the month of February. I know this year is already like super busy. Uh, and those are just some of those things that the JC, JTC organizations are doing to move forward with uh, regenerative economies, moving away from extractive industries. Uh, so that's kind of just a little slice. I know I kind of fire through those. Uh, I do want to thank Glo for putting all the resources uh, available in the chat for those supporting URLs. And also at the end of this call, we will be shooting out these URLs as well in a little newsletter. So I think that's it from me. I think you guys have heard me blabber on for long enough. So I'll go ahead and uh, pass it over to Leah. Um, I see that Claire has our hand raised. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I didn't know how much interaction we could have here, but I had a really quick question. Um, how was Alaska Housing Finance Corporation selected um, as like a partner or a preferred partner on that policy? Um, do you have anything um, specific on that? That is a good question. Do we have a representative here from uh, <clears throat> the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition or was that the uh, Alaska Climate Alliance? Could anybody speak on that here in this Zoom meeting? I probably can't offer the biggest deep dive because I wasn't there building those policies. That was a that's an ACA, um, but gotcha. I know initially it was um, slated to be housed in Ada, which is a very bad choice. Um, I don't know all the reasons why. AHFC is the best choice, but I think they've had some history with providing funding, especially to individuals doing improvements on their homes and stuff like that. So it's a pretty natural fit from what I know. Cool. Um, if there is uh, an individual to like email about that, um, I would really appreciate that. Yeah. Um... Uh, Matt at SIAC.org, M-A-T-T -T at SIAC.org uh, would be a great person, Matt Jackson, to talk to about that. Thank you. And thank you for the question, Claire. I think it's obviously super healthy that we question every decision that's being made um, to move forward with the JTC. So. Are there any more questions right now? You can always ask. Okay, I'm gonna just kind of go through a bunch of the opportunities people have to engage with partners and part of the broader community of Just Transition. Um, there's quite a few events coming up in this month, March and April. So again, we will share links to all of these things, but I just kind of wanted to verbalize them so people can hear them and maybe put them in their calendar to enjoy. Um, first of all, um, we have the Alaska Black Caucus Black History Month celebration on February 12th. Um, it uh, is a virtual community conversation and they have them every Sunday at 7 p.m. Um, February 15th through February 17th, we have the Maricultural Conference of Alaska. Um, February 16th, we have the Elizabeth Peretrovich, sorry, I've years I mess up that name and I apologize, celebration and film screening in Anchorage. Um, that is a collective of partners who are working on that. Um, so they'll be screening for the right of all ending Jim Crow in Alaska at 6 p.m. at the writer's block. On February 18th, um, there is the Matsu Community Climate Fair at Turkey Red from one to four. On February 18th as well, we have the Betty Davis African American Summit and JTC, if you'd like to meet some of us, um, we'll be tabling there during the day. Um, the 24th through the 25th of February, we have the Festival of Native Arts at UAF. On the 25th of February, there is the Black Business Expo in Fairbanks. On the 3rd of March, there is the first Fish First Friday at the Aquila Space in Anchorage. Um, and their submissions are open right now for artists to submit to that. And then the 1st through the 30th of April at Out North, there is the Out North Fringe Festival. Um, so that is a big amount of things and ways to engage in our broader community. 
um, but we wanted to just give a moment to amplify them. And if you have any other things that you would like to amplify to the collective, please feel free to reach out to us and we will get it out there. Are there any questions before I pass it on? Awesome, thank you so much. I will pass to Glow. Thanks, Leah. I was truly sweating trying to get all those in the chat as you talked. Um, hey, everybody. Um, really good to be here with you all. My name is Glow Chitwood. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Just Transition Communications Coordinator, uh, calling in from Supiak land down in uh, also known as Seward, Alaska. Um, and I am going to be speaking a little bit about um, the Just Transition principles and history. Um, like Michaela said, we're going to try to do some some monthly events coming up or at least virtual gatherings for now. And I think it's important to like set the stage um, for our history, um, our collective history, and also just the general long history of of just transition so that we can move forward with sort of a shared language and understanding. Um, so I'm just going to pull up my document here. Um, if you will. I would like everyone to close your eyes unless you're driving while you're on this meeting um, and sit in a comfortable position. And make sure your legs and arms are uncrossed and your posture is relaxed. And if any part of your body is clenched, find that and let it go. So I'm both borrowing and paraphrasing this exercise from an organization called Reframe, so gratitude to them. And keep your eyes closed and picture that it is a sunny day and you are on the beach in Southern California. It's the middle of July and you're there with people you love and it's a beautiful summer day. And you slowly wade out into the waves until you're swimming. And you're enjoying, enjoying feeling the waves pick you up and gently set you down as you kick your legs. You're looking back at the beach where your friends are starting to look like ants when suddenly you see a shark fin in the water 100 yards away from you. So go ahead and open your eyes. And now um, using the, the chat feature, we're going to do some word association. So what words do you associate with this moment? What words would you associate with sharks? You can go ahead and put that in the chat. <laughs> fear, danger, what the heck, shock, fear, panic, abrupt, alert, bad words, <laughs> jaws, Michaela's holding a shark to her camera. Fear. Nature is bigger than me. Thanks, Oak. I like that one. Yeah, music intensifies. You think of that like Donna, Donna. Yeah, don't buckle under pressure. Totally. These are all great answers. So why <laughs> all these answers are pretty similar um why are we so afraid of sharks if you look at the statistics right um sharks aren't especially dangerous or at least no more dangerous than other things that we do all the time um and a lot of us know that but we as a culture still have this deep fear associated with sharks and the short answer is that until fairly recently, there had never been a report of a shark attack on a human in history. But have you ever heard of the Jersey Shore shark attacks of 1916? I had not. <laughs> but in 1916, on the East Coast, um, thousands of people fled to the Jersey Shore to escape, uh, escape this heat wave um, and the polio epidemic. And um, while all these people were on the beach, over the course of a few days, there were a series of shark attacks that left four people dead and one person injured, which was totally unprecedented in, in history. Um, and the story went viral before, you know, before long before like going viral was a thing. 
Um, instantly, a shark panic overtook the country and newspapers jumped on it and they totally sensationalized the story, calling the shark the man eater. And the more attacks that happened, the harder the newspapers hit the story and people stopped going to the beach and some local governments started putting up fences at the beach so that people couldn't go into the water. And for the next few years, we started getting more and more shark media with like maybe Jaws being the pinnacle of shark panic. And these stories constructed a narrative so strongly that when we imagined swimming with a shark, our brains like automatically went to fear. And so stories like these are the building blocks of narratives and narratives are overarching beliefs that impact our culture. So when we talk about a dominant narrative, it doesn't mean it's true. It means that systems have been able to drive these stories so hard into our culture that we start to believe they're true. So when we talk about the just transition principles and this vision for an equitable future and the steps we can take to get there, I want to challenge us all to avoid listening to the narrative that says these ideas are radical because there's nothing radical or new about care and equity and meeting our own needs and being able to take care of ourselves, our communities and our families, right? Okay, word association part two. What words do you think of, um, or at least what has the dominant narrative taught us to think of when we think of the word economy? Dollar sign, dollar sign, money, saving, Wall Street, money, supply and demand, capitalism, more for some, profit over people, that's a good one, bad math, house, extractive, nice Ryan, <laughs> neckties, <laughs> yeah, stress, supply and demand, fake, Colonization, nice. Conformity, greed. Totally. Yeah, I'm, um, I feel like I always thought inflation was something that was just, that's what the economy was for some reason. That was always like a word that came to my mind. Um, and so let's break down this, this word economy. Um, eco means home. And so ecology is the study of the relationship between all living and non-living things and their home, including us and our relationships with each other and home. And so economy is the care and management of home. So when we think about economy, which is a word we use a lot with just transition principles, it's much more encompassing than money and jobs. It's just care and management of home and all that that entails. So, I guess transition or <laughs> then thinking about like what is just transition um, just transition is a set of principles that give us the tools to shift from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. And so the equitable shift from economies that hurt and exploit lands waters workers families cultures communities to economies that care for empower employ and provide just pathways for communities to take care of themselves through an indigenous led vision and worldview. So the transition, this transition is, is inevitable, but the justice that must be associated with it is not, which is why we must consistently check our narratives and let our community speak for themselves and operate in a way, in an intersectional way with the understanding um, that the problems in our society are all connected. And so the solutions must also be connected. So, to quote Gopal Dayanani from Movement Generation with specific examples, um, food sovereignty, energy democracy, transformative justice, cooperative housing, community clinics, community-based healing, traditional foods as medicine. These things all matter because this is not us demanding that somebody else do something for us. This is our communities meeting our needs. Um, and if you're thinking, how can I find an ever expanding concrete list of these solutions in Alaska. Um, here's another link to a, a zine we released last year. Um, that's a, a, a bunch of Alaskan examples. Um, so a little bit of history, uh, just transition principles were developed by black indigenous people of color, immigrant and queer communities closest to the crises who hold the solutions for this equitable future. 
And just transition strategies were first forged by labor unions and environmental justice groups who saw the need to phase out the industries that were harming workers, community health, and the planet, while providing pathways for workers into new livelihoods. So this original concept of just transition was rooting and building alliances between the workers in those polluting industries and frontline communities of color. And building on that history, um, two organizations called Movement Generation and Climate Justice Alliance developed a set of strategies to transition communities towards economies, um, economies of care um, governed by workers and communities. So all that into Alaska, um, because the, the problems we, you know, and, and the solutions are very connected to each other, we are much stronger when we organize collectively. So a few years ago, six organizations formally formed the Alaska Just Transition Collective to work collaborat uh, collaboratively to push the equitable vision forward. Um, and those organizations uh, right now are Native Movement, Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition, Alaska Community Action on Toxics, Native Conservancy, the Alaska Center, and Alaska Public Interest Research Group. Um, but many communities, organizations, and individuals in Alaska are doing this work um, even though they're not necessarily like in the collective. So individually, our organizations work on issues of climate change, tribal sovereignty and land back, environmental justice, worker rights, food security, and more. And collectively, we have a much stronger narrative. Um, our collective uses the phrase remembering forward or kotrelna in Binti Kanaga as a way to approach the strategies. Um, the dominant narrative wants us to believe that transitioning to systems of care for all Alaskans is radical and new, right? But remembering forward reminds us that the ideal vision is rooted in fundamental indigenous knowledge and economies from the past. So um, the narrative, uh, those overarching cultural beliefs is shifting because the stories tell us that the transition is already happening and it's not radical and it's not new and it's all encompassing of our systems. Um, and I think I want to leave it there, uh, even though there's so much more to say, but I will have there will be more times to say more, but I'm going to leave it there for now. Thank you. Back to Michaela. Wow, wow, wow. I love it. Thank you so much, Glow. I was not even expecting that. I just, yeah, fell into the story. So thank you so much. Whew. Okay. Back in Alaska no longer in Southern California, and we like it that way. I am now have the pleasure of welcoming some of our lovely organizers and community members who make the idea of gender justice and healing the very focus of vast majority of their time here on earth throughout the day. Um, I'm going to first pass it off to David Clark as we begin this discussion on queer love as resistance. Take it away. All right, hey everybody. Thanks for having me here at the Just Transition Community call, uh, February call. Um, as Michaela said, my name is David Clark. I use he and they pronouns. Uh, traditionally, my family on my mom's side comes from uh, Norway, Wales, and the Prince William Sound region of, of Alaska, specifically Nuchik and Tetlik, uh, those communities. And my father's uh, side of the family comes from southern Idaho with uh, strong English and German roots. So that's kind of that's kind of the um, the background that I bring with me today in terms of uh, family. Um, I've pretty much been queer my entire life. And I think a lot of um, my past experiences and kind of the kind of problems that I've grown, that I've gone through has really kind of influenced my decision to become uh, a queer active, act I don't, you know, I don't, what is the term, what does the term activist even mean? You know, when, you know, community work is just kind of what you do, you know? Um, so it, I, I guess like, I'll, all that to say like kind of like my past experiences um you know with growing up queer in Anchorage kind of those traumas and some of those uh successes has really kind of got me thinking about queer joy and queer community and really what it means to be uh what, what it means to be queer and I think to you know 
to be queer and to have joy is to be in community, is to be in community together. And I'm not too familiar with the just transition principles, but from what I from what I under from what I understand, uh, transitioning to a just economy really, uh, you know, has to have the power of community behind it, right? So communities need to be able to stick together, especially the historically historically marginalized ones. Everybody knows that queer people have been persecuted for for millennia and, and are continuing to be persecuted in a lot of different fashions across the and, and a lot of different ways across the country. Um, but I think the important thing to remember when thinking about queer love and queer joy is that our experiences aren't isolated from each other. So as much as we should be focusing on leading the just transition in Alaska and shifting to a really sustainable economy that um, is good for our planet, is good for our communities and good for our climate, um, we also need to be focusing on building each other up. And what does that look like? Um, you know, it, it looks like creating spaces to be authentic together and to create, you know, authentic, authentic joy. Um, within my time here, I've been with Native Movement for just under two years, and uh, in that time, I've gotten to work on uh, Queer Craft Night with Planned Parenthood, and, you know, I remember being able to, like, having some really deep and really kind of impactful conversations with queer Alaskans from across the state. Um, being able to talk to them about legislation, being able to talk to them about advocacy and testimony and things like that. Uh, getting to work on Drag Queen Story Hour for the past couple past couple of years, um, and uh, you know, having to like really hold back tears because you know babies are saying the pride flag means that everybody gets to be loved and accepted in in their world, and that nobody's less. Um, <laughs> yeah, like and it like just saying that like brought like brought me back serious chills, you know, throughout my body, um, and you know, getting to just organize with the gender justice team, period. You know, I think when we're talking about queer joy and the work we do, like part of the work we do is is in community and the gender justice and healing team is definitely, um, you know, part of my queer community, part of my queer family, part of my queer joy. And because we get to do so many things together to show up with authentic joy and radical presence, you know, radical presence meaning you are here for each other as human beings, not just as coworkers. Um, and joy is also like really found in that, but joy is also really found in that fight together, right? Because our experiences aren't isolated from each other. There's a lot of joy to be found in working together on a lot of different issues. And some, and I, I often think back to Gunnar's article for the Trickster Times this past year, this past AFN rather, on doomerism and finding joy in um, organizing together, right? I think what really resonated about what Gunnar wrote was that we can think about issues of climate change and capitalism as insurmountable, you know, uh, because when we think, because you know, when you think about it as a, as a singular person, you know, there it's 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 a little bit too much to handle, you know, and you know whether we whether we like to talk about it or not, like, uh, you know, social change work, um, economic change work, kind of like the change work that we're all engaged in, is really a long haul kind of thing. So it can be very uh, daunting to you know, think about, to, to think about, like, what's the point sometimes, but, like, Gunnar was saying, and if I remember correctly, feel free to correct me, if I remember the, like, the whole gist of the article, it's, it's that you're in community together, and there's inherent joy to be found there, and there's inherent, um, there's inherent fuel in that for the soul, um, and so, you know, we're working to build a new, uh, a new world and a new future together, and there's, you know, sincere comfort in sharing that struggle with people who have your back, um, like working with Planned Parenthood last year to stop the anti-trans sports bill and being able to build relationships with Freedom for All Americans and the Trevor Project has has really just kind of reminded me like, wow, there's still kind of like a nationwide campaign sweeping the nation on anti-trans legislation at the in-state legislatures. This feels really shitty and this feels really hard. And, you know, sometimes I just, I want to back out because it's tiring. <laughs> But then I think about, you know, faces, even faces that I, I know here on the call without, you know, that, that aren't, you know, part of the movement or the Just Transition Collective. I mean, they are, but sorry, I misspoke. But like Terry, you know, I don't know how many board, board meetings we sat on for years and with choosing our roots and how there, how there have been like really hard times and really, really great times as well. And how we've just kind of been together and how we've just kind of been consistently in that space through all of it. You know, um, Ken and I have definitely stepped back from those from the Choosing Our Roots spaces as of late. But I mean, that's just kind of 
um, and over that, that's just kind of an example, right? And getting to um, see Kira again here on the call um, after we have just met briefly at the Elder and Youth Conference last year in the you know LGBTQ Roundhouse for for Youth. Um, you know, that's that's really where I find my joy is building that community and making all the, and making all those different connections. Because, you know, the work of one and, you know, when you're all together really compounds and um, definitely is definitely important. Um, but, you know, systems change work in, you know, in the sense that we're all that we're all doing it, you know, as much as it creates joy and as much as it creates kind of like, you know, uh, an internal fire to get the work done. It's really, it, it also requires showing up authentically in those spaces. And I think um, that's also, uh, you know, another important thing to think about queer love is showing up authentically, right? I mean, <clears throat> like I was saying before, queer people have been persecuted since civilization began. You know, we've never, we've never really like found our place, um, you know, until recently because we're making our place together for each other. And um, yeah, sorry, I'm to totally, <laughs> I totally lost my place in my, in my, um, in my talking points. But yeah, that, uh, I would say that engaging authentically with others and being able to build um, positive and honest connections with my team and kind of community partners around me is part of why uh, my work on the gender justice team has been successful, especially with relating, especially relating to policy and kind of advocacy. Um, and, you know, I'll admit it can be occasionally difficult and frustrating. Um, but I mean, systems change work has never really been easy to begin with. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it, I think at the end of the day, it's, hold, it's about holding yourself accountable to self-improvement as you work to improve the world around you, stay open to learning from others, and also be, be willing and able to teach humbly. Um, you know, uh, so I, yeah, I guess all of that, you know, to kind of, uh, wrap up is, um, it's about community building. It's about, you know, finding fuel in the fight, you know, with each other and through each other, but also holding yourself accountable to showing up authentically, right? Um, you know, I've always been of the school of thought that um, being queer is kind of like a radical resistance to the boxes that society tries to put you in, right? Um, and if, because if you're in the boxes that society tries to put you in, you're kind of trying to maneuver in a, in a situation in a world that, you know, is already limiting to you. So to me, being queer and showing up authentically means, you know, st like staking your place, being unapologetic about it, but also holding yourself accountable to building those relationships so that the work, so that the systems change work that you do do can sustain itself for much longer because relationship really is the currency of this kind of, of this kind of work. So with all that said, I think I'm done. <laughs> Thanks so much, David. Thank you for your authenticity. And I could feel the emotion and some of the things you were saying. So I'm feeling it here for sure. Um, and you made me think of something like that. I was explaining this to one of my friends the other day that queerness to me is like saying yes when you really mean yes and saying no when you really mean no. And a lot of us have just like suppressed even the understanding of do I want this or do I not want this? And it's like being clear and authentic with yourself about what that is. So I love that. That really made me think. So now passing it on to another lovely member of our community. We have Sasha Kramer here. Take it away. Hello. I'm Sasha calling in from Denina lands in Anchorage, Alaska. She, the, she, they pronouns. I grew up in Pilot Point, Alaska on Bristol Bay and my mom's last name is Abayo. So there's all of that. I'm Alutic, Supiak and white. Um, I am the gender justice and healing organizer at Native Movement. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about kind of the themes and things that Native Movement is going to be focusing on throughout this year, and then uh, diving into my role into making those kind of come to life. Um, we recently had a series of deep dives within Native Movement with our 
advisory board um, full of community members and elders who are, they just re give really good advice and they help to center and ground us and uh, reflecting on what we've done for the past year and what we want to do in the upcoming year. Um, and there's they're always so rich and so full of ideas. So I'm not gonna be able to get everything, but I think the main themes that I've been taking away is um, one is the intergenerational nature of the work that we do. So having access to elders and also taking the wisdom from from youth and the, all that they ha have to offer. Um, and we're just like all in this together. Uh, like all of the activism that's happened in the past happened like in people's homes because they saw the change that needed to be done and they made it happen. Um, we're also, one of the major themes is healing as community and traditional medicine um, is something that we're focusing on a lot. And kind of looking back at our role as Native movement in the history of Alaska and what we've contributed so far and how we're going to do that moving forward. So I feel really, really lucky in my position um, as the organizer on the gender justice team because I get to organize these different events. I get to help contribute in bringing these to life. And I feel like I'm just like a little gay party planner and I get to uplift queers. And I'm just so joyful that I get to do that. Um, so one way, some of the events that we have coming up that kind of exhibit queer joy and art and activism is um, we have a romantic spectrum awareness coming up in it's in February, the week after um, Valentine's Day. And um, I am really excited to be partnering with UAA Pride Center to be having a Palentine's pajama party. Um, <laughs> so people are going to come in their pajamas and we're going to have a discussion about what the aromantic spectrum looks like um, and how to be a good ally and just talking about attraction and romance and kind of examining it instead of just accepting what society says it's supposed to be. Um, I have the Facebook event for that. Put it in the chat just now. Um, and I'm really excited because we, I don't even, I feel like I don't even do the hard work. I have a coworker who put together these little like things and I feel so cute handing them out. Like I'm just planning a slumber party in school. Um, and we're going to play truth or dare Jenga and um have like little forts and everything. And I just feel like I love having the opportunity to reach out to um, indigenous queer youth and make it all about like wholesome fun, queer joy. That's what it is. Um, we have um, bi-monthly um, craft gatherings. The first one is actually tonight. Um, everybody is welcome. We have that at the Native Movement office. Tonight, um, I'll be bringing some writing to work on and I have air dry clay to share. So if you're in the area and you have time, we can just do art together. Um, coming up in March, I'm working with the Native Student Services at UAA to do a screening of Two Soft Things, Two Hard Things. And afterwards, we're going to have a group conversation in Native Student Services about um, what it means to be Indigenous and queer and just talking about the rural versus urban aspect of that, because a lot of the students that are going to be there come from the rural villages like I did. So just kind of navigating what that looks like. Uh, we have a an Anchorage Office, Native Movement Office mural coming up that we're working on and we've been planning the different themes 
of that. And we have, we're reaching out to our community staff and um, advisory board on what kind of, what we wanna commemorate on that mural. And we're going to be doing a wheat paste training open to the community at that time. Um, and it should be really good. We wanna focus on creating a quarterly podcast. Um, so kind of each quarter will focus on each season and interviewing different queer indigenous people and uplifting them and just having that representation and visibility available for other queer indigenous people or everyone just, I doesn't matter if you're queer or indigenous, if you can get joy out of it. We've been, we just kind of solidified our plans for our, all of our pride events. And I'm really excited. We have a, um, of course our, Drag Queen Story Hour, which David mentioned earlier. And we'll be having a diversity in the outdoors solstice party. So, uh, and a queer men's gathering. Um, we got a grant to develop narratives surrounding uh, violence to the lands and waters is violence to our bodies, violence to our cultures and violence to women. Um, and we're coming up with a community storytelling opportunity surrounding that theme. Um, and then the last thing I think I want to mention is not about Native movement. I'm just really excited about the EPA's final declaration for the Clean Waters Act. Um, talk about queer joy, am I right? <laughs> and I think I just, again, I want to just reiterate how lucky I feel because I a lot of my coworkers deal with the, like the hard parts of this work. I have friends who do work with missing and murdered indigenous women or David who spends his time thinking and like translating policy and all of that is so wonderful but um, I feel really blessed that I get to like do the healing aspect and like the joy aspect of like providing rest from those really hard tasks because uh lord knows I'm too tender-hearted for for all of that so I just get to have silly little parties that <laughs> um yeah I think that's the the bulk of what we're focusing on for now thank you so much Sasha your parties yeah we need silly little parties that's exactly what I was wanting to say I love it I love it thank you so much and now you all have great ideas of what you can do next week come hang out with us um all right so we have two more speakers keeping track of time we have eight minutes of course I'm sure we'd all love to stay on here and be joyous for the rest of the day I will pass it off to Ryan without further ado Hi everyone, I'm Ryan. Thank you for having me. I My pronouns are he, him, and I'm queer. I'm joining you from Ketchikan on Tlingit Ani. I'm the vice president of the Ketchikan Pride Alliance and founder of the Ketchikan Queer Collective and Loud and Queer. Loud and Queer is a quarterly zine filled with queer artwork, writing, resources. Gunnar's showing it right now. Um, and uh, our goal is to inform, inspire, and build community. And we encourage anyone with a connection to Alaska to submit to be featured in our zine. While we're based in Ketchikan, we work locally and regionally to make queer experiences visible and queer voices heard. As part of that goal, we send free copies to schools and public libraries throughout communities um, or to communities throughout Southeast Alaska. A um, little tidbit, uh, Side note, at one point, uh, a Ketchikan high school teacher 
shared a story of one of her students finding the zine in her classroom and saw them physically have a reaction of like shock and amaze. And the student had just moved from Tan, which is Prince of Wales Island. And they said they felt alone, but by reading the zine, they immediately felt connected and they weren't alone. Uh, and that's exactly what we do is, and that is queer joy. Um, we're currently available in 20 communities in Southeast Alaska and one community in Prince William Sound, I think that's Valdez. Um, and we're creating tangible proof of our existence and of queer joy. Um, that's the, the main goal. Um, the zine was founded in 2021 to increase visibility, improve access to resources for queer people. Um, it was really the catalyst for it was a protest in 2020 in Ketchikan because a floral shop denied service to a uh, gay couple for their wedding. And it was the first time that I and other people in our community saw uh, the presence of other queer people in a uh, large uh, amount, right? And not only that, but then the outpouring of support of allies in our community, realizing that first, we're not alone. There are other people like us, and we have the support of a lot of people in town. And that actually also led to Ketchikan passing a non-discrimination ordinance, becoming the fourth city in Alaska to do so, because there are no currently no uh, state uh, protections for uh, discrimination based off of gender identity, presentation, um, or, or expression, or sexual orientation. Um, so that was sort of the whole catalyst of this, of really why it's important for us to be visible, because it creates change. Um, queer people live full lives in Southeast Alaska, but like I said, there's little, little evidence proving our existence and few opportunities for connection across such a large region and remote region. And queer people, especially queer, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, continue to face discrimination and violence in their personal lives, at work, in their communities, and in accessing healthcare. These factors lead to a sense of isolation and feeling unsafe and unwelcome. And this specifically is why queer love is an act of resistance. Despite all of the challenges we face, queer love brings us strength, allows us to heal, and prepare for the work ahead. Loud and Queer, the zine, we often cover difficult topics along with submissions of queer joy to do just that. Um, communities in Southeast Alaska are and should be welcoming homes for people of all gender identities and sexual orientations. And we are super excited to collaborate with Just Transition and focus on queer love as an act of resistance because marginalized communities are disproportionately affected by extractive economies, pollution, and climate change. And I think it's really important to explicitly link queer health, queer love to transitioning to more restorative economies and communities. So um, with that, if you wanna learn more about us, follow us on Instagram at Loud and Queer Ketchikan. Join our mailing list to get the best of what's queer in your inbox the moment we publish each issue. And if you live in Southeast Alaska and you would like a copy of Loud and Queer in your community, you can reach out to us at loudandclearcatchacan at gmail.com. So thank you. Wow, so, so cool. I'm going to tell everyone to submit things. I will now pass it off to Gunner. Thanks, Michaela. <clears throat> and thanks, Ryan. I am so happy to hear from you and everything you're doing because I I'm obsessed with the zine. I love it. I'm really happy to see what we do with Just Transition and, and Loud and Queer because that's really cool. Um, we have three minutes left, so I'm going to keep my part a lot shorter than I was thinking I was going to. And that's amazing because we had a lot of cool speakers. And I don't think I can say anything new that everyone else hasn't said here already. Um, so I think I'm going to spend my couple minutes just talking about some other people that are doing really cool work. Um, especially gender expansive people. Um, and the first one, I have two. Uh, the first one that I want to talk about is uh, postcards from Matt, uh, Marianne Thomas. Um, they are um, on their blog, they, they call them, they introduce themselves as the queer brown daughter of Malayali immigrant parents. 
a critical care nurse, bicyclist, and writer. If you haven't read anything that Matt posts uh, or are a part of their blog, I super, super, super recommend it. You can find it where Glow just posted it. Um, they also do a bunch of workshops. They have Zoom recorded workshops on land trauma or land pleasure. Um, and they're really amazing to, to watch. I think one part that really sticks out to me um, and I've learned through uh, Matt and a friend of mine is, is building a relationship with land as you would like a relationship with um, a lover or a friend uh, and make uh, dates with the land, setting an actual date with the land to go and meet with it and hold that as you would a relationship with, uh, with, a, with you know, a loved one. Um, thinking about uh, ocean dipping is how it was heard, how it came to me um, as setting that date and really, really being intentional with that. And I thought that was a really beautiful way to to sort of connect with the land in a way you might not have before. So uh, definitely recommend postcards from Matt. Um, and the other one is uh, Joshua Whitehead. I don't know if anyone has read anything by Joshua Whitehead. Johnny Appleseed is so good. Um, and they also do a lot of really amazing poetry. They're an OG Cree um, two-spirit author. Uh, I was just in Juno this last week with the ACA fly-in and somebody read one of their poems at a, a open mic and it uh, kind of rekindled my like, I need to search more. Um, and then my friend Celia who's on here was like, you should check out um, his uh, Making Love with the Land. It's a collection of essays that he just put out this last year. Um, and it's just a bunch of essays that tie his indigeneity and his queer identities um, into loving with the land and uh, really great, a lot of heart wrenching and beautiful essays that I'm digging into. Full Metal and DigiQueer is another one. So I figured my best use of my time here is just saying read those. Uh, I think uh, as somebody who found their queer identity at the public library, I think it's my duty to tell you all to read some books. Um, so those are my two options that I'll give you. Thanks. Thank you, Gunnar. We love reading and public libraries. Well, with that, our one hour has come to a close. It's put so many smiles on my face and I see lots of smiles on your faces. So go forth and be queerly joyous. And Koyana, Gunashish, thank you everyone. See you in March.